Hello, everybody. Uh, so typically, you know, we might dive into uh, some task level or, you know, uh, strategic level search stuff, or even, you know, kind of update you a little bit of what's going on in the recruit school environment, make sure the information uh, across the board is consistent. <clears throat> but one thing we uh, that kind of gets overlooked in the fire service is, you know, the reason we search. A lot of times it's difficult, uh, especially as we run EMS calls, we're able to just disconnect ourselves from the citizens is uh, to understand the human factor that's behind it. So the purpose of this class is to not necessarily dive into how we search, but more of why we search. Uh, so we'll get into the primary purpose. Uh, before we even begin, I, I do want to give a, a huge tremendous shout out to individuals that have been influential on in me. They've helped me along the way. They've assisted me. A lot of my information uh, has been you know stolen repackaged uh and then plagiarized but I, I do attempt to cite the sources uh it's not because um if i forget you it's not because i didn't want to to mention you i just you know there's a lot of people and this list is nowhere near the amount of people that that have helped me from start to finish so uh let's look at it so statistically we know fires are down uh we can look at the trend we can look at the numbers uh and we hear it over and over we're not running the fires that we used to Data would suggest this is an accurate statement. <clears throat> the issue is, when we look at the deaths across the nation, we see that it continues to rise. Uh, and you know what? We have to think about why this happens. We know that fires are burning a at flashover temperatures quicker. They're reaching those conditions faster than they ever have. Buildings are more compartmentalized and energy efficient. The fuels that are used in homes will release more energy. Uh, we combine that with the fact that. Uh, you know, we don't run the same amount of fires, so the experience level for the individuals compared to previous eras of the fire service is going to be down, and we can see that the deaths continue to rise. It's important for us to understand that, uh, you know, the frequency of threat has gone down, but the uh, magnitude of the threat has not. In fact, it's increased over time. Those numbers laid out in a different form kind of show us that, you know, the 3.2% uh, reduction in fires have still led to a uh, 25 percent increase in fires in that 10 year span or 10, 25 percent of deaths in that 10 year span we want to compare some stuff so cpr is another one where we know that statistically the survival rate is very low uh we're waiting for the new update of aha uh, numbers and it would really be helpful if they release so sooner rather than later but this is kind of what we have to go by right now and so we know that uh, there's about a 12 percent survival rate for cpr and it, even in the hospital uh, it's a 25, you know, one out of four chance there. We we dump a significant amount of money in medications, treatments, and equipment that we're providing for these citizens when we do these cardiac arrests, knowing that the chance of survival rate is low. But we do it because it's a possibility for them to make it. We compare that with the fire victim rescues that are happening across the nation. Uh, 2,162 fire deaths as of today, December 19th. Uh, when you look at last year's civilian fatalities, 2139, uh, we're using data from the Firefighter Rescue Survey. Uh, 2,190 submitted surveys over the course of its uh, inception. We are wanting to try and get Firefighter Rescue Survey put into NIFRS. The problem is that's a government agency, and right now all they track is a fatality. They don't necessarily track the important information that the Firefighter Rescue Survey is putting out there, such as when did you find the victim? How long? Conditions? What method of removal? All these things that can help us make, make more accurate decisions in future fire rounds. Uh, you know, as a department, when we're waiting or when we receive uh, a, a fatality fire or victim fire, we kind of want to get information from our personnel. Uh, you know, listen to the audio, go over the, not to critique or not to second guess any of it. We just want to figure out what the trends are in our populace civilians and what the, the crews are doing that are putting us in position to find, locate, and remove victims as rapidly as possible. So let's get into why we search. Uh, one thing that we, we always hear about is the fight or flight mentality when we deal with civilians, but there's a third one and that's really freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, this one incident happened up in the 4th Battalion uh, and you talked to a lot of the individuals, Battalion Chief Graham, Captain Theron, uh, Forty, you have uh, Lieutenant Garrett was on this incident, Captain Holly was on this incident, right? A lot of people, and you know, their even comments were, hey, we thought we were at the wrong house because of how little smoke was actually showing from this structure. Uh, her bedroom is right here on the Alpha Delta corner. And she makes up her mind based on this audio, as well as, you know, where the crews found her that 
Uh, she wasn't going to exit. She wasn't going to try and run out. You know, in regards to fight, flight, or freeze, she was going to sit there and either be rescued or die in that building, in her mind. Uh, so let's listen to, this is one of the few audios out there that we actually have uh, the civilians reference as they're inside of the building on fire. And where is your where is your bedroom window in relation to the like do you have any like what side of the house okay your bedroom faces the street okay and how many people are in the house with you okay your dad and your brother yes So, you know, they did a great job. They ended up going through the front door, found her room. Everybody was removed from that. Dad was found in the garage drunk, right? She didn't ask to be put in that house on fire. Uh, she didn't ask for her dad to get drunk, try to cook at two in the morning, fall asleep. Uh, you know, she was completely dependent on both the information the dispatcher gave us as well as crews arriving. So, you know, one of the things we'll hear and we'll talk about in a little bit is, you know, if they can get out, they will get out. Uh, you know, time and time again, we see what humans do under panicking conditions and, you uh, Exiting the structure rapidly is, is typically not it. Uh, you know, so we'll see another one, right? This is kind of the younger generation. This is what they do when their building's on fire. Literally, black box. Oh, shit. I gotta get a jacket. Yeah, no, it's gonna be cold as shit outside. Well, we definitely gotta go. This is all on our floor. Either that or underneath us. You guys got flashlights? It is fucking bad, dude. So they're trying to get animals. They're trying to get everything squared away. I would argue deleting his browser history is probably the most uh, responsible thing he's done so far. And then they uh, attempt to exit through this breezeway. And, and we know that you know once breezeways become involved, they're really oh God, that's black. stopping any of the egress points for the victims other than windows. It's so okay, it's okay. We got smoke getting into our apartment. We can't do this shit right now. Luckily, we're right by the door. Ready? Go, 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 go. Holy shit. Close your eyes. Be careful. You got it, got it, got it? Go, go, go. You okay? All right, come in. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. All right, so we know, you know, just based on this video and, and based on our strategy and tactics, that once, we, once breezeways are involved, we have to get hose lines to extinguish the fire in the breezeways, create egress points for any of the victims inside. 
that we know that the, whatever amount of apartments that are involved or you know connected to that breezeway, all the egress paths could potentially be shut off. And we have windows that we have to start working from. Uh, we search uh, because we value life as an organization. You know, when you look at our incident priorities, where number one is protect and move endangered occupants and treat the injured. Uh, you know, it says right off the bat that our, our job is to get in there. Uh, when you look at our risk management matrix, you know, we respond with the assumption we'll save lives and protect property. Uh, these are all things that we would point to that show that we value life. Uh, we have cop fire cares, we have defects, we have all these things that we can notify if we find a civilian that's not in, you know, the best health or the, that is helping themselves. Uh, but we still give it every opportunity, even when others don't, including family members, as we can see in this video. Transported to Lavana Hospital in a critical condition. The two boys were left unattended while their mother and aunt left home to go drop off a friend. We left, uh, I don't know what time she was, so she went and dropped the food off at home because we had some her friends and stuff. So we went and dropped her off them off at home. They were just slumped over like rag dolls, you know. When they picked them up, their arms was down, their legs were just hanging in. You know, everybody went into an emotional uproar. However, the children's aunt who left the house with the mother said she has no regrets about leaving the children home alone. I, I really don't, you know, because, I mean, if they had been there by themselves, I don't know how the house got caught on fire. I don't know if the boys set it on fire or somebody throw something in there to set it on fire. I really need to get in there and see that my purse burn up. Because I had my food stamp card and everything. All right, so she doesn't value human life, but we do. And so, you know, by us getting there searching, you know, possibly finding those kids, uh, you know, we then have the avenues to get those children in a situation that might be an improvement. We still give, you know, give every opportunity. Uh, we search, you know, regardless of time of day and regardless of information. So one thing we can see here from St. Louis, uh, four children, three in cardiac arrest at the time, uh, at one o'clock the afternoon, were rescued from a single uh, residential home. Uh, we see that one was in a closet, two in a play tent, third near a closed door. We can see the images, which are extremely powerful, and all four of these children survived. All four of these children, you know, discharged without deficit. Um, an impressive incident, but you know, it doesn't matter time of day, especially when you look at the, the different labor market. You look at, you know, you know, people used to say cars in the driveway. Uh, you know, I know for. A, fact my wife parks a car in the garage you would never have any idea people are ubering you know to work people use public transit we cannot use just simple um, cars in the driveway or toys in the front yard as our primary decision for if we're going to search uh, aggressively or not and we search even because when we come up short we still give some opportunity um, you know this is elijah and Teresa elrod and they were a um, fatality in Six's territory several years ago. And you know, this was a, a difficult incident for a lot of people, but you know, even though Cruz got to these individuals later than we would have liked, uh, you know, it gave the family some, some grievance. They were able to have a, an open casket. They were able to say goodbye because Elijah lived four days on a ventilator before you know, he succumbed to his injuries. And you know, five other children were able to receive organ donations uh, because per Cruz were able to, to remove him um, in, a, in as rapid manner as possible. And, you know, she was able to come out where the family was able to get some closure and was also able to bury, you know, a, a body and not just, you know, remains uh, found later in the incident. So what we really want to push is uh, it's about searchability, not survivability. And that's something we teach with the recruit school. This is a point that's driven home with them. The, the, the question should be asked is with my gear, can I get in that environment? Can I search it? And if the answer is no, we're going to put hose lines in position to make a better location, a more desirable search real estate, and to create some opportunities for that searchable space. Uh, but, you know, if, if it is searchable, even if it's a VES, a window system search, and in and out one room, or we, the possibility for expansion, we want to identify those. And it's not just from the front door. It's not just from, you know, the backside. It's room by room, whether we're inside or outside. Can we get in and search that, that compartmentalized space is really how we should be viewing it. Uh, <laughs> So 
so we get a, this is gonna be out of Corinth, Mississippi. We, we look at this heavy fire on the alpha side. We see some searchable space here. We get some information that somebody's inside. I mean, this is not even a VES. This is just a rapid, dirty grab as you can get. Uh, opens a window, tells his partner, hey, I got a victim, we're going in there. Opens a second window. You know, there's some discussion on does that help or hurt the, the flow path, as Sean Gray would say. We know that we're adding, you know, an egress or a, a vent opening for an exhaust, probably not helping. Uh, you know, closing the door would have been the best decision, but this individual sees the victim, hops in, has the ability to dirty drag them out pretty quickly. Uh, if you'll pay attention to the bottom right of this window, you can see the victims transfer over that windowsill. There's a firefighter outside and there's a victim that goes out. And we look behind and we see, uh, you know, we know that that is not a searchable space, what that firefighter came out of. So it's important to understand the difference. You know, we're gonna slow that video down so you can see the transfer. But we like that because right here it is searchable. And we know that the longer we wait, the less probability both of the survival of the victim and the searchable space exists. So we need to make sure that, you know, when that chance happens and we have the manpower, uh, that we, we take the initiative and we get after it. We know our first priority is typically going to be a hose line on the ground. We want to get a water supply established early, but search really is going to be in there with it. If, you know, in your first two apparatuses, your first two assignments should be attack and search. And because this individual was able to get in there pretty quickly, quick transfer of the victim over the windowsill, and we, we see the difference from that searchable space when he first entered to on his way out, you know, we would need a hose line for us to enter that space. Uh, and we, we don't allow the front door to dictate conditions. You know, uh, there's been several fires lately where we've, we've heard uh, incident commanders ask crews, is there searchable space? Can you find searchable space? And that is a great job of looking at the picture, the full view of that building and not just the front door or the back door, the main bulk of the fire. Uh, because not only are there searchable spaces from the exterior, but there might be compartmentalized spaces inside. Uh, you know, we look at this, this is out of Arkansas. Uh, we have fire on the outside. We don't allow that front door to dictate the full structure of what's in there. We know that there's a possibility from compartmentalized or isolation. We know that, you know, people can be behind closed doors. Uh, and we see her come out and, you know, she was discharged two days later from Arkansas Pediatric Hospital with no deficits, right? Uh, it's, it's impressive what a closed door can do. And it's more impressive of, you know, when we can get to them, how much lives we can actually save. This is going to be Los Angeles, and you know we see this fire here. Uh, this is going to be the an exterior entry hotel. Uh, we know a lot of times on these layouts that the bathroom is typically going to be towards the rear. There's a closed door that somebody can get to, an isolated area. Uh, we know on interior center hallway hotels or motels that the bathroom is going to be right by that front door, that entrance points. Some of the newer ones will have it kind of one bed and then the bathroom and then the second bed, so it's towards the middle. But we look at those fire conditions. And then we look at the victim coming out, right? Clothes still intact, no significant burns visible. Uh, and this is a respiratory issue. This is not a burn issue. This is not a fire impingement issue. This is a respiratory issue for the citizen. And we have the ability to control respiratory tracts. We have, uh, you know, cyano kits. We have the ability to innovate. We have all these things and equipment that we can provide. Uh, it's our job to use them, but we have to get the victim out before we can get theirs. We know that people are dying from respiratory hazards before the fire ever gets to them. So if time is our enemy, speed is our weapon. And, and, you know, this is one thing we drive home with the recruits that it's not our time to waste. If we're slow at masking up, it's not taken away from us. Our equipment's going to be there and our air is going to be there in our SCBA. It's taken away from the unprotected respiratory tract inside the building, right? And we look at the time versus survival rates in the first 2000 rescues released by Firefighter Rescue Survey. Uh, we can see that uh, you know, as the time continues on the fire ground, the survivability and the re uh, removal time uh, goes down as well. So, you know, in those first two minutes, even up into those four to six minute mark, you know, we're over the 50% threshold. Uh, when we start going six minutes plus, eight minutes, 10 minutes, we really start to see a, a decline in those numbers. So uh, as you're, if you're not quick, 
No, let's go back to that one. If not quick, if you're not ready, uh, somebody will be. And if you don't take the, the appropriate action, somebody will. And so what we see here is, you know, we kind of lose sight of the, the big picture. And we know that we have a diminishing time frame. And sometimes we just have to act. But if we are not ready and that civilian is not there, conditions get worse and that victim's remaining in that building. Uh, so for those that, you know, you know, I know like Battalion Chief Lester just had a mask up challenge in his battalion. I love it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, those of us that are prepared and ready to mask up quickly are only gaining time uh, for the unprotected respiratory tract inside the building. You know, another thing that we hear that, you know, was kind of drilled in my head in the recruit school environment is we don't walk on or run on the fire ground. We move with a purpose. Uh, if my family is inside that building, I absolutely want firefighters that are running to help them. Uh, we, we see a confirmed victim from Fort Walton Beach. We can hear her in this window. All right. I want I want firefighters running because my, my family's in there. So you know it's all about taking time back for that unprotected respiratory tract. So we can see these conditions. We can actually see vent point ignition. So we see flames at that window, right? We, we know we can't search it right there. We get a line in place. They start extinguishing that fire. They're clearing that window. Now we have a searchable space. We can hear this victim inside the building. Help me. All right, we saw vent point ignition. We saw flames. This is one uh, task that we need to be proficient at is that elevated first floor window. Uh, police officers aren't always there for us to step on them. Uh, so if you carry shorty ladders on your apparatus, uh, Trevor um, has said that we're starting to look at specking those for, for situations just like this. Uh, you know, whether you have a Halligan, some type of tool, we have to have the ability to get those elevated first floor windows. There we see the victim transfer out of the window and she ends up surviving. So to drive home that point, right? Searchable space, uh, rapidly time diminishing. Uh, they bought our searchable space back with a hose line. We're able to get back in there. The victim ends up surviving. Uh, so I'll apologize uh, in advance for some of the language of this civilian. But what we see is a multiple victim fire here. Uh, we know that the first line has to be put in place quickly. Uh, you know, sometimes lines need to be positioned to just hold searchable real estate. Uh, we know that extinguishment is the ultimate goal. And we know that the best exposure protection out there is extinguishment of the main bulk of the fire.
excited right here in that corner. Get out! Get out! Get out! And so we, we look at this fire and we know that either civilians are trying to get to that front door or they're honestly probably moving away from the fire towards the other areas of the house and being uh, trapped or cut off for their egress point. So not a lot of water here and we get a good steam conversion. We get a decent amount of knockdown. And you can hear that person in the background screaming for help. They're on the third floor trying to get out. You know, so just because the line's in place, all right, multiple things have to be happening. Uh, we have to get a line in place. We have to get a search going, whether it's a ladder, off ladders, whether it's through the front door. Uh, the light show, although impressive, is not the main reason we're at these incidents. It's for the civilians trapped inside. And we, and we really need to be looking at multiple prong approaches for this. So we see something like this. We see a victim second, third floor. We obviously want to go ladder. We want to try and get a ladder for an egress point. It confirms our egress at bare minimum. But now we have two prongs of approach. Firefighters through the front door, back door, firefighters off ladders. You know, what's one thing the Patent Chief Lewis always preached? Uh, you know, look at second avenue of approach for your entry into the building. So as one crew is getting the ladder, we should get a crew up there to that top floor. Uh, so they can either move that victim to a different location to isolate if safer or to help guide, you know, outside rescuers and, and providing calm to that victim. And we can see that if we don't stay, you know, disciplined on the important tasks, extinguishment and search, uh, that we can have fire growth that starts putting our civilians and rescuers back in an issue. <clears throat> right, so we see a, a child coming over there on that ladder. And it's so hard um, being on a couple of these incidents. It's so hard in those support functions of fire attacks or second line or water supply when you have an all out you know, commitment to that civilian rescue. But we still have to be disciplined and do these other jobs that are going to buy us time searching, buy us time removing the victims, preventing a greater survivable opportunity for anybody inside. We have to stay diligent and disciplined on these other tasks going on the fire ground. So one, the other thing we hammer with the, the recruits is where do we search? And the answer is everywhere. When do we search? Every time. And the big one is who searches the stairs. If we're the first floor search team and we counter a stairwell run into the second floor, uh, we want to make sure we clear that to the top landing, hook and look and come back down. Why do we do this? Well, we know that uh, typically in, if we need to remain with voice contact, that one firefighter could be at the bottom stairs searching that area around them, and one firefighter can be at the top hooking and looking that stairwell is an interior corridor for any victims on the second floor trying to exit. And if we wait until we complete the entire first floor search before we hit those stairs, uh, who knows how long the possible exit of that victim might be uh, staying at that stairwell if they were overcome by toxic gases or smoke. 
The same thing goes on a second floor search. You know, if we're a second floor search team and we, we beat ES, we decide to push forward, we find those stairs. You know, we're not sure if the first floor search team got to them yet. Uh, so we want to knock those out. Once again, back to the bottom of the landing, hook and look and back up. If we see a confirmed victim, hear a confirmed victim, we obviously change and we go all out for that confirmed victim. Uh, but we want to make sure if we encounter stairs, we, we clear those as it's a main exit for any victims above the fire. And we want to, uh, you know, get that done pretty quickly. So rather than wait for the entirety of the floor to be searched before we get to it, uh, we are drilling with the recruits and, and most crews at this point are, if they find stairs, they're sending one guy up to hook and look the top and they're finishing the search around that bottom area until they complete it. The exception, obviously, is if, uh, you know, if, if we make face-to-face -face contact with a crew as, you know, we're coming up the stairs and they're coming down or, you know, we're going down and we see a hose line coming up, we know that, you know, that crew has searched the stairs. So that's really the exception when it comes to it. Uh, the other thing why we, we want to drill who, when do we search every, or every time and where do we search everywhere is we look at the victim reports. Uh, so in, in this, roughly 3% of reports of everyone out uh, is when we found a victim when you look at 2,000 rescues. And you look at no report of all is 28% when victims were found. So a combined 31% of victims found on structure fires came from either a negative report, i.e. no one's in there, or an unknown report. Uh, we don't know, we're unable to make contact. That's huge. Uh, if we were to write off buildings because we don't have any contact of individuals inside, or we have reports of everyone's out and refuse to search, we would be eliminating one third of fire victims. Uh, you, that's like, we, we would never do a medical procedure that eliminated a one third survival rate of anybody. So it's important to understand that although we don't have, you know, as accurate information of, hey, somebody's in there in this location, we still have to get in their search. You know, that argument earlier of if they can get out, they will. Uh, well, not everybody acts that way. Not everybody acts, you know, in a manner that you would expect during an emergency. We deal with firefighters day in, day out when we're here. Uh, we're trained professionals that are expected to act a certain manner when we arrive to these incidents. Uh, the civilian populace is not that same method. Right. So, you know, luckily they were really able to get him out, but, you know, his initial intention wasn't to exit. It was to go investigate further. This is later on in that incident. You know, we can see the conditions of, you know, how easily that individual on the chair, if that family wasn't there, or if he didn't realize it and start exiting or met closer to the fire, we would expect to find him somewhere face down in this room right here. So, you know, the, the value of a closed door is an isolated environment, but even then, uh, you know, victims can sometimes catch self guard. So we, we want to expect victims every fire. And so let's uh, listen to this story about closing before you doze. And then also the fact that this fire had no confirmed entrapment and reports of everybody out. So there's one person who's standing in the driveway. He comes down, meets us, tells us no one's in the house. And he's there by himself and he thinks the fire's in the kitchen. And after all the units got on scene, uh, they pulled a hose line. They started masking up to extinguish the fire. Kyle and I, we were paired up and we went inside. Myself and Vinny went in ahead of the hose line, the engine crew behind us. As we were going in, the smoke was, uh, was real thick, real uh, uh, oily, I guess, for a lack of better words. You couldn't wipe it off your mask. We did a left-hand search. Um, 
came to the kitchen area and the flames started rolling over our heads. The hose line passes us, they hit, hit an attack on the fire. And uh, Kyle tells me, he said, hey, let's, let's go right. Let's finish the search. He passes me, I grab his shoulder, I say, wait, 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 do you hear that? And that's when uh, you could hear her cry out for help. And as soon as I finish saying that, you can hear her knocking on the door. Help, help, help me, somebody help me. There was no smoke in the room. It was completely clear. She just kind of jumped up into my arms. So he grabs her and I instantly went into, let's make a way. So I push things out of the way, push people out of the way if needed so we could get her out. I'm just talking, make sure everything's all right, check it around. Next thing I know, here comes a child getting carried out right in front, right in front of me, screaming. And I'm going, what just happened here? All right, so uh, they did a great job, right? They still searched. They found a victim behind a closed door. Uh, you know, but initial reports of everybody out. We cannot uh, take that as the only account. We have to be the professionals in search everywhere, every time. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, multiple incidents in the department where people have arrived on scene. Hey, no one's in there. And then I'm pulling victims out. You know, there's three off the top of my head that I could just remember. And I'm sure there's been plenty more. And so, you know, vacant structures, that's another one. When you look at our policy, there's a difference between vacant and abandoned structures. Uh, fire. But even with that, you know, it's not our job to dictate what individual and, you know, at what quality of life do we say that they're worth saving? Uh, we give Narcan for a reason. It means we believe everybody deserves a second chance. Vacant structures are no different. You see the arm come out of that uh, vent right there at the bottom of that window? And, you know, one thing that's key on that incident commander right there, additional resources. Uh, nothing depletes your resources more rapidly than, uh, you know, two plus crews being involved in this rescue. You'll probably have a search crew. Uh, depending on the victim, you might need a second crew just to remove them, and then you'll need a medical intervention, whether it's a rescue, an ALS engine. Uh, and they'll, they'll be attached to an ambulance company all the way through transport, depending on how, you know, if that Sino kid's given. And that's just for one victim. You add multiple victims, and we have multiple resources being eaten up. And there we see the victim rescued from the vacant abandoned structure. Right, and the other thing we push with the recruits and that we, we really, uh, we find really important is find a victim, find another. Uh, statistically, it's about 1.7 victims per residential structure fire and 2.5 for multifamily dwellings. So we're gonna see this video out of Ohio and it is powerful.
And this incident resulted in seven, seven children fatalities from one arson incident. And so we want uh, you know, to know that if you find a victim, search around quickly and then start removing that victim. And that you know, if, if loved ones are in the house, you know, family members are gonna try and get them out. And if there's children, uh, you, know, you might not get accurate information, but we are searching everywhere, every time, and we expect to find multiple victims. Statistically, if we find one, we are going to find more. In our department's history, uh, you know, modern living mobile home fire killed eight. This is still the largest civilian loss of life that we've had in our department's history. Uh, and it's from a, uh, a double wide mobile home, you know, that resulted in three generations of a family getting wiped out. Uh, we see it still. This is going to be in Powder Springs, Station 10's first in. 16 people displaced from a single family structure, uh, including a newborn. So, you know, expect to find one. You're going to expect to find multiple. And, uh, you know, you have to occupy all the space in that building to ensure that it's clear. And kind of it comes down to if, if we are not going to do it, who will? Uh, we have continuously taken on more and more response responsibilities. Uh, you know, we're an all hazard department. We deliver a lot of different programs and services. Uh, but, you know, if we need help with a tree, we call DOT. If we need assistance in EMS, we have transport agencies. We have gas companies, electric companies. We have tow trucks. We have trip responses. We have all these additional resources that can come help us if we, we need additional manpower. But when it comes to, you know, putting fires out and pulling people out of buildings, there really is no other agency but ourselves. So we need to make sure you know, we're proficient at it and we're, we're good at it. And you look at the close before you doze message you know, pushed by UL that has had a huge outcome on, on survival of, of building fires, structure fires. Uh, you know, for the first time in agreement we're, we're making with the, fire, with the civilians is the fire department is saying, if you close your door, <clears throat> if you stay where you're supposed to and you can't get out, we will come for you. Close your door, have your family sleep with the closed door, and our fire department is trained and ready to respond and pull you out. You look at all these mom groups or these you know, Facebook family groups and you see the same stuff over and over. Uh, hey, I live on a second floor. Uh, my child's bedroom is across from mine. It's down the hallway. My kid doesn't sleep in the same room. When I close the door, is my child going to be safe? This is a genuine concern. And the department's done a good job of, of training and getting ready for it. And, but we need to do our part at the field level of, yes, we will come for you. And that's the understanding we have when we tell citizens that they're going to sleep and stay behind closed doors and structure fires. So, you know, we're kind of driving the point home of why we search. And we're going to listen to a couple of stories. We're going to see some images of, of, of you know, the human life and how impactful it is. Good evening. We arrived before the engine got fire blowing out of two windows on the third floor and the people in the street are screaming there's two kids in there we're about to get our ass kicked and there's nothing we can do about it it's 1976 and lieutenant tommy anello leads the way as usual he is simply the finest fire officer i have ever worked for besides having cast iron balls, he has a sixth sense that leads him to trap victims run up the stairs, we get to the third floor, it's quiet, it's too, it's scary quiet. I put the tip of my halogen in between the door and the jam. Pat takes his ax out, he starts slamming into it. We spread the door from the jam, we pop that door in just a couple of seconds. The only water we have is the two and a half gallons of the extinguisher that Pat's carrying. And with what's waiting for us inside that apartment, that two and a half gallons is a bad joke. We swing the door open and the smoke just comes right out. It fills the entire hall, turns the night into day. We drop down onto our bellies and we crawl in. We got to go in deep as fast as we can because we got nothing to, no water. There's no engine company. So we got to get in and we got to do the search as quick as we can. We get in three rooms. We go in the door. There's a hallway to the right. It leads into the apartment. There's rooms off the hallway on the left-hand side. We push all the way back. Pat's knocking the fire back with this can till it starts sputtering and we run out of water three rooms in. As far as we can go, the fire owns the apartment in the back. 
Tenon and Nello turns into the furthest room. Pat grabs the second room, and I crawl back to opposite the doorway that we came in, and I start crawling in through the kitchen. Can't see nothing. I go down, straight down the middle till I hit the wall. It's quick, it's dirty. I figure if anybody's down, I'll run into them as I'm crawling through. Can't take the windows, because we can't feed this thing any more air. It's already rolling across the ceiling and down out the door behind us. This place is going to light up in a couple of seconds. I reach the far wall, turn around, come back, find nobody. Tommy screams, get out, get out, it's going to light up. We get outside, we close the door behind us, the relative safety of the hallway. The engine's coming up the stairs. They charge their hose line. Tommy gives them the layout of the apartment where they got to go. It's time to go back in. We push the door open. The f***ing fire comes out, meets us in the hall. The engine just starts hitting it. They're pushing it back in. As they go in, we're right behind them. We can do a search now. We can do a better search because we got water protecting us. As they're pushing the fire down the hallway, the three of us go into the kitchen. I go right back to the window and I take the glass out with my tool. Right then, Tommy, six cents kicks in. And he looks in the cabinet, looks down at the cabinet under the sink. And he sees this little arm laid out. The two brothers, five and three, who started the fire playing with matches while their mother went grocery shopping, are under the sink. The little guy's got his arms wrapped around his big brother. And that's how he died. His big brother tried to close the door to protect him from the fire. And he died trying to save his brother's life. I grabs one kid, I grab the other one. We run out of the apartment, down to the floor below the fire, and we pass him off to other firemen. We're beat, we can't do nothing. The other firemen start doing CPR on him. And up the stairs comes mom, a bag of groceries under each arm. She sees a dead kid laying on the floor. And the fireman try to try to breathe life back into the. She drops the bag and says, "Oh my babies!" I got right in the face and I said, "You didn't give a f about your babies when you left them alone, did you?" Why did I do that? I must have been angry at myself for crawling less than a foot away from these kids and not finding them, but I took it out on her. I don't regret much in my life. I really don't. Regrets are useless. But if I could change one thing in my life, I would put my arms around that woman and comfort her on what had to be the worst day of her life. Thank you. And so we hear, you know, there's obviously a wave of emotions going through, you know, when this uh, lieutenant pulls these kids out and then you know beats the mother and and instantly regrets you know what he says to her and uh you know you you hear him tell his story and how devastated he is not by the fact only that they didn't get to him in time but uh that he wasn't there for that important point when somebody uh needed him to be and, and that mom lost her, her her children uh you know why is it it's so important for us to search and why is it so important for us to, to be aggressive uh, you know, David Rhodes used to always talk about it's a numbers game, right? The ability to give one more day, one more you know wedding anniversary, one more birthday, uh, you know, opportunity for someone to go to their their child's graduation, to make it to the ability to walk their daughter down the aisle. It's a numbers game. That's really what it is. And so you know, always looking for that number of one more. And uh, you know, you just you listen to this kid talk here, and you realize you know how delicate life can be and how important it is that uh you know we want to give everybody the opportunity for that one more day and you know this outlook on life that, that this kid has is it just demonstrates you know what we're possibly giving to somebody by pulling them out of structure fire like on friday it gave you air to story about zach sutterfeld he suffered burns on 70 percent of his body in the fire at the iconic village apartments in San Marcos last year. Even after all he's been through, he still manages to stay positive. I don't think people realize how precious life is until it's almost taken away. How 
beautiful it is to feel the sun on you or to smell roses or to make your mom laugh uncontrollably. There's something so beautiful in the little things in life like that, that I used to take for granted. And so, you know, I loved my job when I first got hired and, you know, I was always pretty into the job and I had a lot, my focus was on, you know, more than just my career. You know, there was things outside of work that I was enjoying being a young single fireman and, you know, kind of looking for all the, the things that came with it. And uh, it wasn't until, you know, this is my wife, Chelsea, and this is my daughter, Andy. And it wasn't until uh, these two came along that kind of flipped that perspective. And, you know, for those watching that have children you understand the biological switch happens when that child comes out into this world and in that moment you realize that uh there's a level of love you didn't know existed um and so it's it's eye-opening to understand that somewhere in this world somebody loves another person the way i love that little girl and when you realize that not only do you realize how important it is to search but how important it is to get back to that numbers game of one more day, you know, one more birthday, give the opportunity to make it to retirement, to see her walk down the aisle and how, you know, to see, an, you know, another family gathering, another graduation, another wedding anniversary with my wife. And that how important it is to make sure that other people have that same opportunity. If you have any questions, comments, Feel free to reach out, email me, call me. You know, I'm always there. Uh, I appreciate you sitting here and uh, hopefully it wasn't as bad as uh, other mandatory training.